October of 2009, the newly formed Platinum Games created a franchise that served as the spiritual successor to the character action genre. Bayonetta quickly became the poster child for the publisher after Hideki Kamiya took everything he learned from his time at Capcom and poured his love for stylish action into a brand new IP, while simultaneously keeping the genre alive. I dabbled in the series when I was a youngling, but it wasn't until Bayonetta 3's release that I decided to marathon the whole series, and today, I'm going to be going through every single game in the Bayonetta series and ranking them on its tier list, starting with S tier being the best and F tier being the worst. I also need to once again disclose that I am ranking these based on my own personal opinions and trust me, I'm sure there's going to be something in here that'll make you want to put me in a torture attack, but instead if you do hear something that you disagree with, please let me know in the comments below, I would love to talk about it. And with that out of the way, let's begin with the game that started it all, Devil May Cry. Actually wait, I did a video on that already, didn't I? I tried playing this game on my 360 when I was a teenager, but something about it wasn't really clicking with me at the time, so I never finished it. It wasn't until a few months before Bayonetta 3 released that I decided to give it another shot, and I had a much better experience with it this time around. Bayonetta is an Umbra witch who wakes up with amnesia after sleeping for hundreds of years. She owns the left half of a pair of jewels called the Eyes of the World, and believes she can regain her memories by finding out about the second half of the jewel called the Right Eye, which her informant Enzo helps her track down at the city of Vigrid. Along the way, Bayonetta kills any angel that crosses her path and encounters a mysterious woman in red named Jean, who is somehow connected to her past. She also meets this lost child named Cereza, who believes that Bayonetta is her mother, and a young man named Luca, who blames Bayonetta for his father's death after he discovered her. His father being Antonio Redgrave. Huh. Now before we get into the nitty gritty, I gotta be real with you guys for a second. I don't mean to toot my own horn, but I consider myself to be pretty decent at action games. So I can't tell you how much it pains me to say that I am ass at Bayonetta. <laughs> this is one of the most challenging action games I have ever played. And every time I jump back in, and even when I was replaying the game for this video, I was getting my shit rocked. This doesn't hinder my enjoyment of the game at all, but what we'll find out later on is that compared to the rest of the games in this series, this game's combat is the hardest to master, at least in my opinion. While the combat of Bayonetta obviously takes a lot of inspiration from her demon hunting predecessor, there's more than enough here to make it feel unlike anything else on the market, especially at the time. Light attacks are used for quick punches while heavy attacks give you stronger kicks with longer windup, and if you hold down the attack button during any part of the combo while using her gun weapons, Bayonetta will actually shoot the guns to do more damage and keep her enemies airborne. On top of having a dedicated shoot button with the ability to enemy step and you'll have an absolute field day stomping on these enemies. Literally. Most of these combos will also end with powerful attacks called Wicked Weaves, which are these giant demon limbs that do massive damage and even stun enemies. Each of the dial combos will have different priorities with their weaves, and while you can totally just mash light and heavy attacks over and over again to kill everything, you're encouraged to experiment with the different combinations to get higher score rankings in each enemy encounter. Doing this also fills up a magic gauge, which can be used to perform various special moves and accessories that you can get in the shop, or unleash powerful torture attacks that'll absolutely humiliate your enemies. Speaking of enemies, Enemies. The enemies in this game are super fun to fight, except these pieces of shit. And what I really like about them compared to other action games is that even in regular combat, they'll differ in scale both in difficulty and in size without having to adjust the combat to accommodate fighting the latter. You know the expression, the bigger they are, the easier they jump cancel. And as these enemies are first introduced as mini bosses, they'll come back later on as regular enemies and you'll have different combinations to fight at the same time. The other thing is that because you're given access to so many tools and because Kamiya likes his challenging video games, these enemies move fast and and hit hard even on the normal difficulty. You'll need to make sure you're at the top of your game at all times because those small missteps add up. And if you're not careful, you may run into another tough enemy with no way to heal yourself. The bosses on the other hand are something else entirely. These guys are massive and will have multiple stages and set pieces that make them such a fun spectacle to fight. And just like in Kamiya's other character action games, we have the pleasure of fighting these bosses multiple times, including the trademark boss rush that these games are known for. While I don't necessarily find the bosses themselves that memorable, the interactions that Bayonetta has with them are what stick out in my mind. I feel like a fucking celebrity in this town. 
Now the mechanic that arguably defines the combat in this series is Witch Time. When you use the dodge button to avoid an attack at the last possible moment, enemies will slow down for a period of time, leaving them open for counterattacks. If you mistime your dodge, you'll still get a slower Witch Time, but the goal is to get better with your timing and have more time to rack up those style points. This ability is unfortunately a bit overused in the other games that Platinum makes, but this is the series that defined the mechanic and in my opinion, uses it the best. There's a plethora of different weapons that you can collect such as swords, whips, ice skates, rocket launchers, and you can mix and match your loadout by equipping these weapons either on your hands or your feet with minor exceptions like the sword only being usable on your hands and the ice skates for your feet. It's really fun experimenting with different combinations to find what works best for you. I personally like having the default guns with Durga and a sword with rocket launchers, but that's mainly because I love doing the exploit that gives you a hilarious amount of rockets. The weapons have universal inputs such as Stinger or Afterburner Kick, but as I mentioned earlier, holding the button down after pressing an attack will give you an extra function, like charging a sword slash or grabbing an enemy with the whip and bringing them to you a la Devil Bringer. While the combat and weapon variety feel satisfying to play, especially when comparing it to other games in the same genre of character action, there's a few other gameplay choices here that I'm a bit mixed on. So we're gonna bring back my segment from the Devil May Cry video and talk about the written and directed by Hideki Kamiya sections. For starters, this game has platforming that's really hit or miss for me. Sometimes it works well and you'll be zooming through the levels, and other times you'll be falling over and over again and wanting to rip your umbran hairs out. You get access to a panther and crow form that lets you run super fast and even stall in the air, and one of my favorite pieces of movement tech is actually sprinting and jumping with panther, then doing a dodge forward that'll send you flying through the air. The Route 666 section is really fun, albeit a little jank, especially if you go too fast and run the risk of falling off the course. On top of having QTEs in the middle of combat, which I'm personally fine with, we also have them during cutscenes that will kill you instantly if you fail them. Sound familiar? These types of QTEs definitely overstay their welcome in my opinion, and I'm so glad that this is the only time that they were used in the series. Especially when you're one instant QTE death away from a pure platinum, and the game smacks you in the head and says, Fuck you, stone rank. In typical platinum fashion, there isn't a way to customize your controls unless you're on PC, but even then you can only customize it on keyboard and mouse and not on controllers, which is irritating. And finally, the space harrier section is without a doubt my least favorite part of this game. And that's almost exclusively because when you press the dodge button, the camera will move with Bayonetta as she does the barrel roll. It's super disorienting and it actually made me feel sick while I was playing it. As for the story, I think it's all right. There's a lot of really great moments here and watching Bayonetta do her thing is super entertaining, but I can't help but feel like this game is more concerned about getting to the next fun set piece rather than telling an interesting and cohesive narrative. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but then towards the end of the game you have your fight with the big bad and he has to start the fight with this huge monologue explaining his evil plan and why he's evil and I just completely checked out. But I think my point is further reiterated at the fact that the final boss has these series of gigantic set pieces and ends with you punching God into the sun and you have to control the trajectory of God so they don't collide into other planets otherwise God will bestow another stone rank upon you it makes absolutely no goddamn sense at all but I don't care because it's pretty awesome in the end I really enjoyed my experience with Bayonetta. The combat is very solid and the set pieces are really fun, even if I didn't enjoy all of them. The story is a bit whatever, but there's a ton of great moments from Bayonetta here that cement her as an iconic character in the genre. There's still a ton of extra things I need to do, like fighting the secret boss, going through the Angel Slayer Lost chapter, and beating Infinite Climax difficulty, which actually takes away your witch time. But it's absolutely more motivating to go back and finish these extra features when the combat here is that solid. I'm gonna put Bayonetta 1 on A tier. Back in 2014, I bought a Wii U for two reasons. Super Smash Bros. 4 and Bayonetta 2. And after giving up on the first game about halfway through, I decided not to get Bayonetta 2. So to this day, the only game I have ever owned on my Wii U was Super Smash Bros. And when it was announced that the first two games were getting ported to the Switch in 2018, I was so grateful that I could finally give them another chance. I got it for Christmas that year, and they were shelved until a few months before Bayonetta 3 was released. Before we get started with talking about the game itself, 
I think it's important that we talk about the pre-release drama. In case you're not aware, there was a ton of backlash back in the day when it was announced that Bayonetta 2 would be a Nintendo exclusive title for the Wii U when the first game was released on PlayStation and Xbox. But it was shortly confirmed that Bayonetta 2 and by extension Bayonetta 3 wouldn't exist if Nintendo didn't partner with Platinum Games. There was also a lot of concern that Bayonetta would get censored, which thankfully didn't happen, and apparently Nintendo didn't really do anything other than just foot the bill. I also wanted to mention this because a lot of the technical issues that I'm going to delve into for this game, and especially Bayonetta 3, are exclusively because Platinum was restricted by Nintendo's less than stellar hardware. With that out of the way, when I first played through Bayonetta 2, I had an absolute blast with it. But it was during my second run on Infinite Climax that the cracks started to form. This is a game that can be best described as taking four steps forward and two steps back. I think it does a lot to improve on the first game, but there are also a lot of things in here that make it feel worse. Starting off, this game is absolutely gorgeous. It has more vibrance that make it feel so fun and colorful compared to the D saturated and muted colors from the first game. Both games have a combination of full and still cutscenes, but I feel like there was more action in the cutscenes this time around, which was really cool to see. The game unfortunately runs at 720p, even on the Switch version, and occasionally there will be frame drops, but overall it seemed pretty consistent. Moving on to the combat, I know this is where I'll probably lose some people, but in my opinion, this has the best overall combat of the series. Now before you go into the comment section and Umbra Climax me into oblivion, I have my gripes with it that I'll get into, but there's something about the smooth and sleek gameplay here that just speaks to me. The enemies seem more fair this time around while still being challenging in their own right, and when Tomorrow is Mine starts blasting, I just get into the zone and start whooping some angel ass, baby. I don't know how else to describe it other than just, it feels good until it doesn't. Enemies will do this annoying parry in the middle of combos that can get really frustrating, especially when you can get into a never ending back and forth when you're trying to style on them. While this game still has the iconic witch time, it lasts way shorter in this game. And that's because it was changed for the duration to be based on specific enemy attacks rather than the timing of your dodge. That means that there will be times where you'll be only given half a second of witch time, which makes fighting the more challenging bosses and enemies a huge drag. A small thing unrelated to combat, but they got rid of the thing I said in the first game where if you dodge after a panther within jump, you get a burst of speed. Now you just fall to the ground and I have no idea why they did this. But I hope whoever was responsible for this gets hit with the... Uh... There's once again a wide variety of different weapons in this game, even more than the last. I wasn't a fan of the heavier weapons, but that could easily be due to it just not being my preferred playstyle. My biggest gripe with the weapons is that I feel like there's so many of them that being restricted to only two weapon slots doesn't give you the kind of freedom to fully experiment. And this is an issue with all of the games, but it's definitely more noticeable in here and in 3. And finally... We need to talk about Umbran Climax. Because I'm a DMC player, I got excited when I saw that they actually gave Bayonetta a devil trigger in this game. But unlike your standard DT mechanic, Umbran Climax completely breaks the game's flow of combat and at times makes it even worse. The biggest problem with Umbran Climax is that these fights are largely balanced around it. And because of that, the game actively encourages you to use it, even going as far as to flash the Umbran Climax button on screen whenever you're able to activate it. So you see yourself barely making a dent in these fights, then about 5 seconds of big damage and the cycle starts all over again. This is also the only way to stagger larger enemies and while it is satisfying to do, it's done at the cost of feeling like a masher which I'm personally not a fan of and not why I play these games. I don't even try to use it all that often and I actively enjoy the combat more because of it, but then I get penalized with not dealing as much damage and giving a lower score since I'm not completing the fights fast enough. And this on top of not being penalized for using health items means that the game can just justify giving bullshit gimmicks to stronger enemies and bosses. I accept Umbrun Climax for what it is, but I personally would have preferred a regular Devil Trigger where it replenishes your health and gives you a slight damage boost without turning Bayonetta into a Dynasty Warriors game. Moving on to the bosses, I enjoyed them here about the same as the first game, but the other thing is that there aren't as many unique set pieces for the larger bosses. They're instead replaced with Bayonetta spreading her wings and flying with the boss in an on-rail beat-em-up section, and these can be hit or miss for me. And finally, moving on to the story, I think much like the first game, it's kind of whatever. The main plot of this game is that John's soul gets trapped in Inferno, and Bayonetta goes on a quest to save her. She runs into a boy with mysterious powers named Loki whose entire character derives to him needing to get to this mountain called 
Fimbleventer? Did I pronounce that correctly? They're pursued by a mysterious figure called the Lumen Sage, who has some of the best boss fights in the game, and an interesting twist that I won't spoil here. Oh, and my son's still in the game, by the way, because people really liked him in the first one. And while the Lumen Sage stuff was really cool, I do not remember a fucking thing about this game's main villain, and the whole plot becomes so convoluted that it just completely lost me at the end. I like this game about as much as Bayonetta 1, but for different reasons. I know I've spent this section focusing more on the negatives, but that's because I enjoy Bayonetta's combat and her character at its core and that's gonna be present in all three of the main games. This game also has a ton of extra things like the witch trials, secret bosses, and a multiplayer mode that can be played both online and locally. Even with its shortcomings, I had an absolute blast with it, and although I can understand why people don't like it as much as the other games, I just personally don't feel that way. I'm gonna put Bayonetta 2 on A tier, putting it slightly in front of Bayonetta 1 for me. Bayonetta. Bayonet Apache Slot is an arcade game similar to the likes of the other game-themed gambling machines that feature an iconic video game series. It uses something called the Infinity Battle System that puts Bayonetta against various enemies from the first game, and the success of these battles is dependent on the player's skill on the slots. I've obviously never played this, but even if I had the chance to, I have absolutely no interest in gambling my life savings away on a pachinko machine. If I was given a controller and some jump cancels, it would be a different story. But since I can't do that, I'm putting Bayonetta Apache Slot on F tier. 8-Bit Bayonetta, or Angel Land as it was previously titled, is an inaccurately named 16-bit style action shooter game for web browsers. Just like the other games, enemies will come towards Bayonetta and try and hit her, but instead of having the intricate combos and insane mechanical combat depth that this series is known for, Bayonetta can't move at all. You can jump and you can shoot. That's it. The goal is to defeat as many enemies as possible before they reach her. You only get one life, so when you get hit by an enemy, it's game over. And it'll give you a score at the end that you can share on Twitter. Now, if this game looks like a big April Fool's joke to you, that's because it is. This was announced on Platinum's Bayo blog in 2010 with a video on the official Platinum YouTube channel showcasing a retro platform game with Bayonetta fighting a bunch of enemies and even showing which time. They stated that the game would be published by Sega before finally confirming that this was actually an April Fool's joke. But they're not done there. On April 2nd, 2015, a Platinum employee tweeted that the studio had produced a new game, posting the URL leading to a 404 page on the Platinum website, which contained the new version of Angel Land. And finally, on March 31st, 2017, the game was released on Steam once again as an April Fool's joke, making this the first Bayonetta game released on Steam. And just a few days later, the game was removed, with Bayonetta 1 finally getting an official Steam release on April 11th. Even though it was removed from Steam, you can still play it on the 404 page from Platinum's website, and you can even play it on your phone, which is what I did, and I'll put a link to that in the description if you want to check it out for yourself. Now I obviously can't judge this in the same vein as the rest of the series, but the fact that Platinum went this far to troll their fans is pretty amazing. And I admittedly did have fun passing the time playing this relatively simple game, plus it's free, and you can't go wrong with that. So I'm gonna put 8-Bit Bayonetta on C tier. I know, I know, this isn't a Bayonetta game, but I feel like her inclusion in Smash Brothers is an important milestone to the franchise, so I wanted to weigh in on it quick. During the final presentation for Smash 4 on December 15th, 2015, Bayonetta was announced as the final DLC character. Her inclusion is thanks to the Super Smash Brothers fighter ballot, where players could vote for their ideal character to be included in the game. After 1.8 million votes were cast, Bayonetta ranked first place worldwide among the negotiable characters at the time. Maybe we'll talk about the series where the actual winning character is from in another video. Bayonetta was actually one of the characters that I voted for in the Smash ballot, and when I was in high school, my friends and I would get together and we would watch all the Smash announcements. So we were all together when she was announced. And when she showed up on screen, I freaking lost it. Wait. Wait. No. Yeah. Yeah. As for her gameplay, Bayonetta is classified as a combo fighter, and she's the only character in the series that has the ability to string together a large amount of attacks from a variety of opportunities. Since she's so combo heavy, her attacks have a slower startup and she actually has a lot of end lag, 
depending on how long the combo is. She also has a counter that triggers Witch Time, which will last longer if her target has more damage. And if you mistime your Witch Time or you block in a certain way, you'll actually trigger a Bats Within. Bayonetta quickly became top tier due to the fact that players were quick to discover zero to death combos, as well as combos that could kill characters at pretty much any percentage consistently. She got an adjustment a few months after her release, but as time went on, she consistently placed very high in competitive play, and this generated a disdain for the character whenever she showed up in brackets. And most infamously, we have Smash 4's final Evo in 2018, where we had a Bayonetta mirror match in what was probably the most controversial set in Smash Brothers history. I won't elaborate on it too much, but the short of it is that the set was treated more like a friendly match rather than the grand finals of a major tournament, with homie stocks and the competitors holding down the B button for almost two minutes straight as the crowd booed them. This whole situation was very unfortunate because I actually had a lot of fun playing as Bayonetta, but I felt like I couldn't really enjoy going to locals or playing friendlies as her without getting some sort of hate for it. At the end of the day, I'm glad she was included in Smash Brothers and that she was brought back in Smash Ultimate, albeit with huge adjustments to make sure she wasn't as broken. I can't properly compare this to the other games in the series, so I'm gonna put it under Smash tier. Bayonetta. I have a very unhealthy relationship with Bayonetta 3. There are times where I absolutely love this game, and there are just as many times where this game drives me freaking crazy. My biggest issue right out of the gate is that this game isn't given any favors by being a Switch exclusive. There is constant frame drops, desyncs in the cutscenes with a massive downgrade in sound design, and the graphics quality is so reduced to the point where the game is just ugly to look at. This is without a doubt the worst looking game in the series. And that's really saying something considering I just talked about 16-bit Bayonetta. The main reason for these downgrades can be contributed to Platinum's ambition to create a game that exceeds the expectations of the series by going bigger with the combat and set pieces, but doing this on hardware that makes Mortal Kombat 1 look like this? was not the way to do it. This game was originally meant to have an open world with a lot of those remnants still being here in the final game, and at the end of the day, I'm glad they went back to the mission structure because I personally prefer that, and I also don't want my Switch to explode anytime soon. Fortunately, these negatives don't interfere with how amazing this game's combat feels. Unlike the previous games where you choose four weapons to go on your hands or feet, now it applies to all four limbs. In exchange for this, we're given what's called masquerades. These masquerades are different forms that Bayonetta takes depending on the weapon equipped, and since there's 16 different weapons with 12 of them getting demon masquerades, you get quite the variety to choose from. These forms take the place of the Wicked Weaves alongside giving you a powered up super move called the Masquerade Rage, as well as a unique method of traversal. You can use Madama Butterfly to fall slowly in the air, all around a triple jump, and my personal favorite is using Discount Phantom to crawl on walls and swing through the air a la Spider-Man style. The other new feature that they added that drastically changes the way that the game plays is the ability to summon demons mid-gameplay. When your magic gauge is filled, you can summon and control the massive demons that Bayonetta has contracts with, each with their own unique moveset and special abilities. There's 12 different demon slaves and you can equip up to three at a time. And what's great about that is that you can actually do various combo attacks with these demons. For example, you can summon a tornado with Malphus and then switch it out with Discount Phantom to make a fire tornado. Bayonetta has to stay in place and do Gundam style while she's summoning them, so you'll need to watch out for attacks coming her way as you're hitting spinning bird kick with Madama Butterfly. However, the real beauty for combat is finding ways of utilizing each summon so that you're swapping back and forth between them and Bayonetta to open up brand new combo opportunities. You can also use them for additional attacks at the end of combos and even as a counter when you're about to get hit. The only unfortunate downside is that while you can still hold down the attack buttons in the middle of combat to continue to shoot your guns, you can't do that at the end anymore with this Assault Slave mechanic. And if you have them out for too long and they take too much damage without resting, they'll either die temporarily or go into a rage mode where you lose control and they go on a rampage, hitting anything in sight, including Bayonetta. All of these new mechanics make Bayonetta 3 feel completely different from the other two games, and whether that's a good or a bad thing is up for interpretation. I personally enjoy these changes overall, and most of the time they can be ignored unless you're playing on Infinite Climax. My biggest complaint overall is that I still wish we had access to more than two weapons and three demon slaves at the same time. It's such a hassle to have to stop the game mid-combat and go back into the menu to swap, especially since you have to stay completely still in order to do it. There's a few other weird things in the traversal that seem to restrict you for no real reason, and it doesn't feel as natural and fluid as it should. And because the demon 
demon summons are the hot new mechanic the game incentivizes you to use it as much as possible by giving us massive damage sponges for enemies and once again nerfing bayonetta's base damage torture attacks also got reworked so instead of the longer animations it's just a quick two button press to do a bit of extra damage which is fine for keeping the flow of combat but i also personally enjoy the moments where we're completely humiliating the enemies with bdsm this game has a lot of set pieces with these demon slaves and while i was having a ton of fun with them during my first run repeated playthroughs left me wanting to skip most of these and just go back to the fast paced action i'm definitely not knocking the game because of that as there are some admittedly cool set pieces here but i'd much rather do the ball opera mini game again instead of playing rock paper scissors with gamora twice up next we have a brand new character named viola who is a young witch hunter that gets introduced to take up the mantle of the original protagonist she's essentially the nero to bayonetta's dante her gameplay is an interesting contrast to bayonetta as she only gets one weapon and one summon with a focus on charging her attacks to deal massive damage and throwing her sword out to summon cheshire while she introduces the homunculi to thunder and lightning her summon is the only one that can be controlled by an ai so you can just throw cheshire out and let it do its thing while you can continue to move around and fight she also gets access to witch time but unlike bayonetta this is activated by parrying an attack rather than dodging it which feels really weird after experiencing all three bayonetta games back to back to back it also doesn't help that i prefer my parry on circle and while there are preset controls to choose from it's a far step for being able to fully customize your kit to your liking now when the game first came out her parry felt clunky and i ended up just using the moon accessory instead since i was just more comfortable with it and that's just what i was used to but platinum eventually put out a patch that extended the window of the perfect parries made it so which time lasts longer and gave you the ability to continue to hold a charge after using a parry to give you more incentive to use it at some point in the game she gets access to her own powered up devil trigger which gives her a health regen with a bunch of fast paced attacks but also fun fact you can just mash the Y button and stunlock every single enemy in the game until they're dead including the final boss I like playing as Viola and I especially love her spunky it's not a phase mom personality but the unfortunate thing about her is that she seems more like an afterthought rather than a dual protagonist next to Bayonetta this is mainly because when it comes to dealing with specific enemies and secret missions she doesn't have the tools to deal with them efficiently which makes them even more frustrating to deal with if her role in the story is to mimic that of Nero the amount of tools that she's given to deal with enemies is a mimic of V. It doesn't make her bad, but it's just more fun playing as Bayonetta or Jean. Speaking of Jean, I have some good news and bad news. The good news is that she finally gets her own missions, but the bad news is that there are side-scroller minigames, with the last one being a bullet hell that made me want to punch kick punch the wall on Infinite Climax. There's nothing to say about them besides they were just fine and fun minigames that were really short and fun on a first playthrough but I pretty much ignore these whenever I pick up the game now. I don't think it's out of there for me to say that the homunculi are the worst enemies in the entire series. While every game has enemy types that are more annoying than challenging, these guys really have a knack for testing my patience with their bullshit. Putting the fact that they're just uninteresting blobs of green boogers aside, the smaller enemies tend to blend in with the environment and barely make any noise so they end up hitting you out of nowhere. And the larger enemies take up so much space that when they do an attack it can cover the entire screen, making it near impossible to see. And don't even get me started on that stupid ass snail enemy. That thing is a bitch and his mom's a hoe. And finally, the thing you've all been waiting for the story <laughs> oh boy i know i've said that the story about the first two games is just kind of whatever but holy shit, this is the most whack ass story any of these fucking games have had and i am so so sick of the multiverse stories i really am i'm not faulting platinum on it because they were working on this game long before the trend got overused but even putting that aside i'm still not a huge fan of it here i think it's a cool concept but the way that the game is paced makes it so predictable by the third universe we're in bayonetta arrives in a new universe and sees a vision we get introduced to the new demon slave we go through a tutorial with said demon slave insert action piece section oh no this universe is bayonetta died Bayonetta rips out her heart or an apple depending on which version you're playing then we go into a mega demon slave mode and play a mini game for a boss fight rinse and repeat until we get to the last two missions I'm also not gonna pretend like I understand the whole Luca werewolf thing because I don't it makes for a good boss fight but just why is he a werewolf and now he's a fairy why is he a fairy 
What happened to my son? I haven't given less of a shit about the main villain since Bayonetta 2, and he just ended up being another big green blob that I just needed to punch in the face. Now, I know the ending is the main centerpiece of controversy, and I am going to talk about it here since I think it's integral to my thoughts on the game. So here are the cliff notes. John dying is really stupid both narratively and how she actually died. And it's funny that they killed her just to revive her, just to kill her again. I think it's really cool that the final fight had a bunch of different stages and I love that there was that rhythm of the opening. But in my opinion, it just goes on for just a little too long. I think the versions of Bayonetta from the first two games coming in was really cool, but I couldn't help but feel like I was watching something I had already seen about a year ago. I think that Viola not getting to fight the main villain was really dumb and her role in that exchange did does not help her case for becoming the new protagonist that can stand on her own. Luca comes in to save the day, and only he and Bayonetta together are strong enough to defeat Singularity, but not all three Bayonettas doing the fusion dance. And finally, Bayonetta dies. Not by Singularity, not by the giant wormhole in the sky, but because Gamora broke free for a third time, by the way, and killed her. I think it's fine that Bayonetta died, but I really hate how they did it, and by extension, why they did it. Obviously, they wanted to introduce Viola as the new protagonist and give Bayonetta a final send-off that closed her chapter along with Jean and even Luca, who is basically the ultimate love interest for Bayonetta according to this game. But at the end of the day, they completely fumbled this ending, and it was entirely because of the execution. It's like Platinum was trying to have their DMC5 without any of the setup, and it doesn't feel earned. When I first beat the game, I think that the shock of the ending tricked me into thinking that it was satisfying, even though I didn't like how Bayonetta died. But the more I thought about it, the more I just felt very empty about the whole thing. And on my second playthrough, I enjoyed it even less. The last thing I need to say before I wrap this section up is that like the other games, there's a lot of extra content in here, such as the Return of the Witch Trials, 14 secret missions for catching the Umbran Tears during missions that'll give you different demon slaves and weapons, a secret chapter that hints at the next game we'll be talking about, and the secret bosses one of them being Rodan. I haven't mentioned it yet, but each of the games has a secret Rodan boss fight that you can get access to once you buy the platinum ticket from his shop. He's the hardest fight in each of these games and for good reason. I haven't fought him in one yet and I made a couple of attempts in two, but I was determined to do everything in this game, so I grinded it out. It took me over six hours, but when I beat him, I was popping the fuck off. You wrote on. Yeah. <laughs> Band out of three is what I would call a complicated climax. The highs are super high, but the lows are some of the lowest in the entire series. I think that the combat at its core is great, but not perfect. The story is even more of a mess than usual, but there's a lot of moments in here, especially with Bayonetta that made me smile. And frankly, I still had a good time with it on my first playthrough. I'm gonna put Bayonetta 3 on A tier, right in the middle of the other two games in the trilogy. Cereza and the Lost Demon. The final game in this series for the time being is a prequel spin-off that focuses on the origins of Bayonetta and how she began her journey into becoming the Umbra Witch she is today. Unlike the other games, this is more of an action-adventure title rather than the hack-and-slash beat-em-up games that we're used to. Your controls are split up between the two main protagonists, Cereza and Cheshire. Cheshire is a demon that possessed Bayonetta's stuffed toy after she accidentally summons him, and their goal is to find a way to get Cheshire home while uncovering the secrets of the Avalon Forest. What I think is really cool about this game is that both characters are controlled simultaneously, with Cereza on the left Joy-Con and Cheshire on the right Joy-Con, and you're required to use both characters together to fight off enemies and solve puzzles. Cereza can use her Witch Pulse ability to interact with the environment for puzzles and binding enemies in combat, and Cheshire acts as the offensive character who can attack enemies. And as the game progresses, you'll unlock different elemental abilities that can be used both in combat and for traversing the forest. This game is definitely a mixed bag for me because as much as I love the stylish hack and slash Bayonetta games, this spinoff is a huge departure from what I personally like about the series and is served more as a dessert for people who enjoy the story of Bayonetta. My biggest complaint 
was that the game was too easy, with no way to adjust the difficulty to make it harder right out of the gate. There's apparently a cheat code that you can use to unlock hard mode right away, but why wouldn't you just give us the option right there in the menu. And while that doesn't necessarily contribute to an objective criticism about the game's combat, I was breezing through it and it felt kind of boring at times. I get what they were doing with the combat and it was admittedly unlike anything I had played before, but I just didn't feel too engaged with it. The puzzles and platforming were pretty fun though, especially once you get more abilities to add to your arsenal. I think the main thing that saved this game for me was the story, which is funny because the rest of the games in the main title have been the opposite. It was really cute seeing this more innocent portrayal of Cereza and seeing her accept responsibility for her actions as a young Umbra witch who is making a bunch of huge mistakes. Cheshire also gets a lot of great moments in character development, and these two characters both have great chemistry together. Even though I felt like I was going through the motions with the combat and the puzzles, certain moments in here actually got me pretty emotional. There's some interesting twists in the story that I really liked, and I'm glad that I stuck through to the end even though I wasn't feeling the game at first. There's also a secret chapter that unlocks once you beat the game that I recommend checking out, especially if you played Bayonetta 3. And this game does have replay value when it comes to the extra things that you can do, and obviously going through the game again with New Game Plus, but I personally didn't see any reason to go through it again, so after I beat the secret chapter, I just put it to bed and haven't touched it since. And the last thing I want to say about the game before I go is something that doesn't necessarily have to do with the game itself, but I think it's still an important thing I'd like to discuss. Personally speaking, I don't think this game should have been $60. I know that talking about the price of video games is very subjective and everyone's opinion and situation is going to be different on how you classify the value of something, but as a smaller scale side adventure that lacks most of the things fans of the series enjoy, I think this game would have benefited from a price cut since we just got a Bayonetta game four months prior, and in my opinion you get more out of Bayonetta 3 than you do Origins. I'm not sure if this is a Platinum issue or a Nintendo issue or maybe even both, but I feel like more people would have been incentivized to buy it if it wasn't full price. Nowadays, it's pretty easy to find the game around $30 to $40, both pre-owned and brand new, and in my opinion, it's definitely worth that price. I think this game succeeds in what it's trying to do, and I think if you're a fan of the series, you'll enjoy it for the story, but I personally don't see how someone could play this as their first Bayonetta game and want to try the other ones. And I also see why people who already enjoy the Bayonetta games skipped out on this one. So I'm going to put Bayonetta Origins on B tier. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes the tier list. What's interesting about this series for me is that I personally don't see any of the three main games at that S tier rank. I like them all pretty much the same and for different reasons, which I can't really say about any other video game series that I've played. I think if Platinum could take all of the different elements that work for each of these games and combine them together, then maybe we could get that perfect Bayonetta game that blows the rest of them out of the water. But until then, those are my own thoughts about the series, and I would love to know down in the comments below what you think of my list and where you rank each of the Bayonetta games. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like as it really does help me out with the YouTube algorithm. And if you want to see more videos like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you want to watch another video of mine, you can check out this video right over here where I go through every game in the Devil May Cry series and rank them on a tier list just like I did here with Bayonetta. I also have my playthrough of the entire Bayonetta series here on my channel, so I'll link it over there as well if you want to check it out. Thank you all again so much for watching. I hope you all have a great rest of your evening, and I will see you next time.